I kind of like to imagine this as like we opened the doors and everybody just flooded in at once. <laughs> kind of like a Black Friday mob is what I like to imagine. <laughs> really the passionate friend lovers. <laughs> So, okay, uh, it's 5.30, I'm gonna get started. Um, I assume there will be some more joining us along the way, but it's great to see everybody that's here already. Um, my name is Victoria Ziegler. I'm the marketing coordinator here at the Endangered Wolf Center. And we are really excited um, to be here with Dale and Lodi of Weiler Woods for Wildlife and our own Regina Masati, who is the director of animal care and conservation at the Endangered Wolf Center. And we're really thrilled to see so many of you that are passionate about red wolves and helping us protect the species. Um, so we have a lot of exciting news, inspirational information for you tonight. So um, we're gonna dive right in. I wanted to give a little quick background of the Endangered Wolf Center. Our mission at the Endangered Wolf Center is to preserve and protect Mexican wolves, red wolves, and other wild canid species with purpose and passion through carefully managed breeding, reintroduction, and inspiring education programs. So we are always looking to inspire you to carry on uh, the work that we're doing. Um, the beauty of these virtual events, um, you know, these are kind of, there's always, could be some technical issues. So just be aware of that. And we will um, try our best to keep on going if any of those technical issues do arise. Um, and, but what, one of our favorite things, truthfully, is just that we can talk to all of you from around the world, and that's been so rewarding. So um, there is a chat feature. I'm gonna go over a couple of these Zoom ins and outs for everybody. Um, along the bottom of your screen, if you're using a laptop or a desktop computer, um, there's a chat feature. There's also a Q&A feature. So if you wanna get in there and tell us where you're tuning in from in the world um, and just let us know that this thing is working, um, the Q&A feature is a great place as uh, our panelists are all going through their information. If you have questions for them, put it in the Q&A and I'll be going through questions at the end. So, oh, I'm seeing people find the chat. Okay, so we see, have some North Carolina folks, um, Ohio, um, Missouri, we're located in Missouri. So it's awesome to see where you guys are tuning in from. So everybody get in there and tell us right now so that we know that it's working. Oh my gosh, that is so cool to see that. Isn't that, that awesome? Yeah. So we love it. Okay, we love hearing from you. It looks like you found the chat. The Q&A feature is similar in location and that's where you can put uh, questions for the panelists. So if anything pops into your mind, put it there and we'll, we'll be answering those at the end. Um, I want to get right into it with um, introducing Regina Masati. She has some great information about the history of the American red wolf for you. Um, Regina Masati is a wildlife biologist and has been the director of animal care and conservation at the Endangered Wolf Center for almost 10 years. Um, she's worked with both captive and wild carnivores for over 16 years including capturing and collaring mountain lions in California, all the way to researching wolves in Yellowstone. So she is currently the vice president of the AZA American Red Wolf Species Survival Plan, and she sits on the management team for the Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan. She's also the foster advisor for the US Fish and Wildlife Service for um, the species survival plan foster efforts that take place for the Mexican wolf, and she's an expert in the field at that effort. So Regina, we're going to turn it over to you. <laughs> I see you cringing, but um, it's true. You're awesome. Uh, take it away and I'll chime in um, in between and keep us on time and everything. Sounds good. Well, that was a very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna jump into it because the real stars of the show are Dale and Lodi. Um, my, my role in this is I'm just gonna give you guys all a little bit of a background in what's going on a very abbreviated background on what's going on with the Red Wolf program and why what Dale and Lodi are doing is so critical to bringing awareness to this endangered species. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, give you guys, give you guys a little background and one of the coolest animals in the entire world. In my opinion, I'm not biased at all. Um, the American Red Wolf, um, and uh, Victoria told you about our mission already. 
Um, the American red wolf is a very special wolf. It is the only large carnivore species that is solely native to the United States. When you think about gray wolves, Mexican wolves, mountain lions, black bears, they all can cross, whether it's a Canadian border or a Mexican border, um, but the red wolf's historic range is solely in the U.S. Um, it was designated an endangered species in the 70s, and Fish and Wildlife Service realized that something was going wrong with the species, and they acted um, as quick as they could um, and tried to round up as many of, of the red wolves in the wild as they could to try and start, at that time, what was the, the first breeding program um, for a large carnivore. And with all the time and effort they spent, they only found 14 pure red wolves uh, to start the breeding program with. So they brought those into zoos. Um, Point Deviant Zoo um, was one of the first, was the first facility to help out with this program and Danger Wolf Center was one of the first as well. And um, the only place they could find them was Louisiana, Texas area. And they kept searching, couldn't find any more and officially declared them extinct in 1980. And the only remaining red wolves were in the captive program. And the reason this happened is because, uh, mostly because of human perception. Misinformation is a big deal, not just now with social media, but it was back then and, and um, was devastating for animals like wolves. And think what you've grown up with, Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs, werewolf movies, things like that subconsciously create fear. And if you fear something, you don't want to conserve it. But there's other myths out there too. There's myths that, you know, red wolves are dangerous. Um, in recorded history, we have not seen that red wolves have killed a human. Um, we have um, misinformation that they decimate prey populations. Actually, they help prey by getting rid of ones that have diseases um, and stop that from spreading to other animals. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of, of misinformation that was out there. And this led to the US government at that time in the late 1800s, early 1900s and starting a predator control program. The reason they did that is they thought that no predators, no carnivores like mountain lions and bears and wolves meant hunter's paradise for us, more elk, more deer. Um, they didn't understand back there then what the ecology of and the ramifications of taking those animals out of the ecosystem would be. And um, we actually saw the opposite happen. We did see elk and, and deer populations skyrocket, but unfortunately they devastated the ecosystem by eating everything down to the dirt um, and diseases started to run rampant in those populations. And they just didn't understand that back then. Once the red wolf population was almost eliminated, the other issue they ran into is if they couldn't find other wolf, red wolves to breed with, they tended to breed with coyotes. Now, red wolves don't want to breed with coyotes. They prefer red wolves. Um, when their population is doing well, they kick coyotes out of their territory or even kill them. Um, but when they're desperate and they can't find other red wolves, that's when hybridization happens. Um, loss of habitat and disease are, are other issues that red wolves face. So they brought these 14 red wolves into the captive program with this first ever like, hey, we're gonna save this large carnivore idea, which was an epic groundbreaking idea. Um, they brought them in and as I mentioned, several zoos stepped up to help them and they were able to grow that population to almost 250 wolves today, which is amazing. And they did it in a way that they were able to raise these animals in wild spaces let them be wolves, large packs, um, you know, feed them natural prey when they can, human hands off. We don't pet them, we don't talk to them, we don't hand feed them, we don't habituate them to humans in any way. So that they stay wild. When they're released, they know and maintain that natural fear of humans. Whenever that two-legged thing comes running by, I run away. And that's what helps keep the wolves safe. Um, and it was successful um, and it was innovative. They did incredible things with this program. As I mentioned, they were the first to reintroduce a large carnivore back onto the landscape where it had, had essentially become extinct. They did this in 1987, which predated Yellowstone, predated the Mexican wolf reintroduction. And both of those programs really benefited from a lot of the work that the Red Wolf program did. They learned a lot of techniques um, like pup fostering, um, how to release them in different ways, hard versus soft releases. Um, being able to do genetic field testing, which is what I'm doing with one of the pups up in the corner. 
Um, so the, the red wolf program really paved the way for not just the red wolf, but for other species as well. And for a while, it was doing great. It worked. The biology worked. Um, from the very first wolves that they reintroduced in 1987 up until 2006, 2007, it grew to almost 150 wolves out in the wild. But unfortunately, um, a disinformation campaign went through at that time, spreading misinformation um, to the local community that really hurt uh, the Red Wolf program and led to poaching being in increasing. It led to um, a step back in some of the reintroduction and management efforts. Um, and unfortunately, what that means is that today, where we were, had a really successful program, we are now down to less than 20 Red Wolves in the wild. But the Fish and Wildlife Service has not given up on the species. Um, they came out with a, a review of this program in 2016 that said the Red Wolf recovery efforts uh, will work. It can work. We've seen that it, it works in the past. We just need to be able to bring the community on board. We need to do more awareness. We've got the biology part figured out. Um, and they came up with multiple goals, uh, two of which were to identify new recovery areas in the southeastern United States where red wolves are native to. And to be able to do reintroduction, they need to secure the captive population. What that means is they need to double the amount of wolves that we have in the species survival plan, the captive program uh, right now. What that means is we need to go from about 250 wolves to close to 400. And uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wants to do this because it not only helps retain genetics of this critically endangered species, but it also helps for them to be able to pull adult animals out for reintroduction into these new areas um, in the future without compromising that captive program and the genetics and the efforts there. And they have put over a half a million dollars towards this um, effort. Uh, C2S2, an organization um, that focuses on conservation, worked uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the center to get recovery challenge grants from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and it's been a, a huge boon because it's helping us work with different institutions across the US to be able to grow um, and build new breeding spaces to help with future reintroduction. And I'm really proud to say that the Endangered Wolf Center was a recipient of part of that, um, that uh, recovery challenge grant and was seed money to help us be able to get donors to step up and help us build two new breeding habitats at the center. And I cannot thank our two amazing <laughs> speakers tonight, Dale and Lodi, were huge contributors to that. They helped us match the grant that we got from the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, as well as the Donald Slavic Family Foundation, um, the WSBK Ross Charitable um, Foundation Trust, um, Washington University uh, for giving us the land, and, um, and again, Fish and Wildlife Service and C2S2. Um, so we're, we're joining in that effort and helping to lead the way to bring other institutions in on that so that we can reintroduce these these guys and new areas in the future. So we know we've got this awesome opportunity. We know we've got Fish Wildlife Service looking for new sites. So how do we go from this? The wolf being a source of fear, the big bad wolf being a source of fear, to the American red wolf being a source of pride. And we have to do that through awareness. We, we learned that um, the hard way, not just in the Red Wolf program, and, but in other endangered species efforts. We have to bring the community in. We have to grow education and awareness campaigns, dispel, especially on large carnivores, dispel myths that are out there that make people fear um, reintroduction efforts uh, and, and really speak to the public. What is important to them? What are things that we can talk about, bring science in to show them that wolves don't just benefit the ecosystem and keep it healthier, but they benefit us too. Um, and, you know, our center and uh, Point Defiant Zoo and other institutions have worked together to design materials um, that can be used for free for institutions and universities and teachers across the country to help with this effort. C2S2 worked with um, uh, a film crew that is just one of the best film crew um, running wild media to create the resilience story of the American Red Wolf film. Uh, Victoria is going to put that link in the chat box so you guys can see it, but a beautiful film that you can share with all of your friends. 
And essentially what this means is that we, we need to work together. We need to collaborate and we need to come up with creative ways to connect the public with this endangered species so they see how beautiful it is and how amazing it is. And we'll wanna step up and help save it. Um, and that's why I'm so excited about our speakers tonight. Um, they have done just that. They have figured out creative ways to get people excited about conservation um, and specifically endangered species um, that people normally wouldn't even know about. And Red Wolf's a great example. Most people don't even know it exists, let alone that it's critically endangered. Um, and, and our wolf, you know, in, in terms of, of being an American. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dale Modi. If you guys have questions for me, um, put them in the, the chat box or Q&A. We'll answer them at the end. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get out of my screen. Thanks, Regina. That was great. Dale Modi, I'm not going to be able to do you justice <laughs> introducing you because you are two of my heroes, but um, Dale became a sculptor and a conservationist in his 40s. After working as an engineer, a Navy pilot, thank you for your service, Dale, and a business consultant, his wildlife sculptures are now in museums and zoos around the world. Lodi is a business owner, an insurance broker, a native plant gardener, and a conservationist at heart. After Lodi sold her insurance firm, she moved to the foothills of North Carolina to be closer to nature and wildlife, where she has funded and helped plant three butterfly gardens in partnership with her local land conservancy. That's incredible, Lodi. Lodi and Dale met at one of Dale's art shows and after eight days were engaged in their late 60s and said, what do we do now? The answer, create Weiler Woods for wildlife to promote awareness and protection of misunderstood animals and their habitat. Using Dale's sculpture and Lodi's blogs, they inspire others to become conserva conservationists for the underdogs. So I give you Dale and Lodi. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. All right, I'm gonna try to um, share our screen right now. So bear with me one second. And I've been putting some, ch some links in the chat. Um, I can see that Lodi looks good. And so if you're, you still have your chat open, um, everybody you can, click on those links or save them for later. Okay, we, we look and can you see the first slide? Yep, you're all set. All right. Well, thank you, Regina. Thank you, Regina. And thank you, Victoria. Uh, we are, uh, <clears throat> we're excited to be here tonight. And this is our very first webinar. So bear with us. Uh, we're really thrilled uh, to be doing this with the endangered Wolf Center, and it is, uh, it's exciting, the path that we are taking uh, with, our, with our conservation efforts. As Regina had mentioned, uh, Lodi and I have only been together for about five years, and we, we met at an art show uh, that I was in, in our local community, and as she had mentioned, uh, it was love at first sight. It really was. Uh, and it's true. Eight days after our first date, we were engaged. So don't forget, even if you're old, you can still move fast. Right. We like to say it's never too late. And we really did, after we met and got engaged, much to the consternation of family and friends, <laughs> looked at each other and said, what are we going to do now? And since Dale was a wildlife sculptor and I love the outdoors and wildlife and I enjoy writing, we decided to take our talents and try to make a difference for misunderstood species, which we lovingly call the, the underdogs. underdogs. So we're gonna talk about art tonight. Right, uh, we've been asked to give a brief summary of the different art forms that can be used to help uh, create awareness in the community about these underdogs uh, to increase the appreciation for these underdogs and to get people to fall in love the way that we have and help protect them. So our first um, aha moment after we got together, we were out at the San Francisco Zoo and we were talking to one of the head animal curators and he told us this story 
He said a blind woman came into the zoo and asked him to describe what, what an alligator looks like. And Joe said, rather than describe it to her, he took her over to their sculpture garden. And if you're ever out in San Francisco, they have a fabulous sculpture garden at the zoo. And he asked the woman to lie down on this 13 foot alligator sculpture. And the woman wept. And she wept for joy because she said for the first time she could see the alligator in her mind. And we were just blown away with that story because it really told us the impact that art can make on, on all of us. Art can touch your soul, it truly can. And another example is at the North Carolina Zoo where they had unveiled my sculpture of a hellbender and they put it in front of their new Streamside exhibit. And if you don't know about hellbenders, they are very secretive animals and they're tough to see. This allows the viewers to come up and actually not only see it, but touch it and feel it. And learn all about them with art. So again, it certainly brings the public in contact. Now, how did we get involved with Red Wolves? Uh, when we were at the North Carolina Zoo for the unveiling of the Hellbender sculpture, uh, the head of their Red Wolf program, Chris Lasher, took Lodi and myself aside and said, if you all love underdogs, have I got something to show you. And Chris took us off exhibit and they had a red wolf pack. Um, and the red wolf pack, two of the red wolves had just had puppies. And they'd had two red wolf puppies, which we got to see. And it was love at first sight, sure was. sort of like Dale and I. <laughs> um, we were smitten. And then Chris told us the story of the red wolf that the only wild pack lives in our home state of North Carolina and they are critically endangered. And this was about three years ago. And at the time there were about 40 left in the wild. As Regina mentioned, sadly, we're down to probably 20 left in the wild. But we knew at that very moment that we needed to do something to help uh, protect these red wolves and help try to save the species. So when we got home, <clears throat> I went out to my studio and started looking through my rock pile to see if I could find any red wolves. And how I work is I do not start a piece until the stone tells me what's inside. I know it sounds odd, but that's how I work. And this piece of stone I'd had for about 10 years, <clears throat> couldn't see what was inside it. It wasn't talking to me. But after seeing the red wolves, there was a reddish color in the top or the front two inches of this stone that just screamed, howled red wolves. And then there was some greenish stone behind that that I could see would be perfect for the vegetation. So, so I want everybody just before we move to the next slide to look at this piece of rock and see if you see two red wolves in it. It's right there. I don't see them, but then again, I'm not a stone sculptor. So let's listen to this. Look what's starting to peek its noses out of the stone. This is the start of the red wolf piece that I'm doing. And how I envision it is a mother slumbering with her pup in her front arm. The wolf and the pup will be in the brown stone and then I will move back into the stone to hit the green, which will then create the vegetation around it. Can you feel these two slumbering red wolves starting to come alive? They're right there. Well, here I am <clears throat> working away on this piece. You can see I'm suited up and I've got some very, very attractive yellow gloves. Yes, Dale likes to be the most stylish stone sculptor. Always looking for style points. Anyway, I'm working on the pup. The pup is at the front of the piece and I'm working back into the stone. And once I capture that pup, then I can start working on the mother and then get back to the back end of the redstone and then hit the grain. Now in this 
uh, this image, you can see the mother and I've got water on it to show you the coloration in the stone. It is just spectacular. It really does mimic that reddish brown coloration in the red wolf. And I'm taking measurements of the pup uh, what's really important is that when you're working subtractively, that, that is when you're removing material to create the sculpture, you've got to be very careful not to remove stone that shouldn't be removed. So you want to be very cautious and take out what you should, but not too much. Now here you see the piece uh, and the, the bodies are all shaped. And I'm about ready to start putting the detail in the fur uh, detail into the bodies. You can see a little bit of the detail that I've started on the, uh, on the ears of the mother. Tell us a little bit about how you're going to create the fur. The fur creation is going to take a number of different steps. I'll start with doing the fine detail on the pup, which requires a very sharp point bit that I can make tiny grooves in the stone. And then as I get into the mother, I'll need a coarser bit with a blunter end than this that I can cut in more ragged, deeper cuts into the fur. And everything has to blend together so that the finished product will actually look like the fur of both the mother and the pup. Here we go. Now in this uh, picture, uh, this shows the sealant going on. That's the final step of the process. <clears throat> and what the sealant does is it both brings the color out in the stone and it also seals it. I'm now putting on the first coat of sealant, which brings the colors out in the stone and also seals it so it'll protect it. But look how the colors in the stone absolutely jump out when this sealer goes on. It really does breathe life into these wolves. So this is Dale after a day's work in the studio. And you can see all the stone dust covering him from head to toe. Don't I look um, neat? And you can also see all the stone dust coming out of his studio. That's one reason we don't have actual video of him working, carving on the sculpture because uh, I can't take a camera in there, nor can I go in there without protective gear. But this is generally how Dale comes in at night after he's been working all day in the studio. And I believe this project took about six months. So yep. there was a lot of stone dust that was uh, created. As you can see, stone sculpting is not for the faint of heart. I suit up like I'm going to war. So another aha moment we had while Dale was carving this uh, red wolf is we got a call from a friend of ours and she asked if her daughter and a couple of the Girl Scout troops that her daughter was in could come by. They were working on their outdoor badge and they wanted to see what a wildlife sculptor does. And we said, sure. So they came over and within the first probably minute that they were there, they really didn't care what Dale was doing as a wildlife sculptor. They wanted to know take it what personally. these animals were that Dale was carving. And we told them the story of the red wolf. And again, that these wolves only live in the wild in our home state of North Carolina and that they were critically endangered. And these three gals became red wolf advocates on the spot. They did a huddle and they came back and said that they really wanted to learn more about red wolves and they actually wanted to uh, donate their fundraiser for the fall to red wolf conservation and do their future projects around red wolves. So it was an, another instance of where we saw how art could have an immediate impact and on touch people, your soul, touch your soul and bring awareness because they didn't know what a red wolf was. Um, so that was a really an amazing day for us. So here's the piece um, in its finished form. And once we got this piece completed, uh, Lodi and I asked ourselves, now how are we going to use this piece to get the maximum exposure? Mm -hmm. 
uh, to bring it out to the public, to get the public more aware of red wolves. And because there's only one piece, we knew that we were gonna be limited in our efforts. So we went back and we talked to Chris Lasher at the North Carolina Zoo. And we also spoke to Ben Prater at Defenders of Wildlife and asked them if they had some ideas about how we could expand the exposure for this piece. And Lodi and I, and both Chris and Ben uh, came to the decision of doing castings and making multiple pieces so that we could make these castings available to various facilities around the US that are breeding and rewilding uh, red wolves. And what Lodi and I decided is that the way we could help is that we would donate these pieces to these facilities to help them in their effort to expand public awareness and get support. So here you see uh, 10 of the castings, um, the originals on the easel uh, behind the 10 castings. And while they all look similar, each one is hand painted. So they're all unique. And they're magnificent. And they are just uh, amazing. So looking at some of the places that the uh, castings have been unveiled, the first unveiling of a casting was at Alligator River Wildlife Refuge. And that's where the red wolves live wild. Um, and we got to go out there and while we didn't see any red wolves, we did see a lot of black bears. So if you get a chance to get out there, it's a great wildlife viewing place. Beautiful habitat. But this, uh, this casting is in the Red Wolf Education Center. And so it's both um, bringing awareness to local uh, residents and also visitors that might be out there visiting the wildlife refuge. And it was just a great day. Defenders of Wildlife sponsored this casting. Um, the next casting, this is actually one of our favorite pictures. This is at Zoo Knoxville and was one of the early unveilings of mm -hmm. the casting. And we got to go over early and had the honor of having lunch with all of the red wolf keepers and they're pictured here. Um, and it, we were so inspired in talking to these folks um, about their commitment, their dedication, their hard work. And I mean, we just came away wanting to do even more for, for Red Wolf. So thank you to all the keepers that might, might be out there listening for all the work you do, because without you guys, we wouldn't have a Red Wolf captive population. And as much as we love <clears throat> assisting uh, the red wolves and the other underdogs, uh, as Lodi had said, we get such joy from meeting all of the people who are helping uh, to conserve and preserve these uh, endangered wildlife. It is, we feed off of their energy. This, what keep, this is what keeps us going. And then last but not least, the Endangered Wolf Center has a casting um, unfortunately, last year with the flooding that went on at the Endangered Wolf Center, and then we had the pandemic hit, um, the casting has not yet been yet installed, but stay tuned because in 2021, uh, there will be some announcements about an installation and we actually hope to get out to Missouri uh, to be there for that installation. Now this next uh, image shows where these castings uh, have been unveiled or will be unveiled. And there are 26 castings that we've been able to donate across the country. Uh, if you had asked Lodi and myself uh, how successful this would be and what kind of a reach we might have, we would never have imagined this. And you can't really see it in this picture, but if you look behind us, there is actually one extra casting um, that we kept um, because we felt like we needed to have one on our wall. That's exactly right. So getting back to, to the, the original, original uh, we found homes for castings, but we weren't sure what we were going to do with the original stone sculpture. I mean, you don't really put it on your coffee table in the middle of your living room. And it's not easy to move around. So what we did is we went back and talk to Chris Lasher at the zoo and asked him if he had some ideas about where the right place would be for this, for this piece. And lo and behold, he came up with 
Arkansas State University. And who knew, we, we didn't know, lots of you all might know, but the mascot for Arkansas State is the Red Wolf. Oh, cool. And if you have never been to Jonesboro, when you go, you will be blown away by the enthusiasm of the entire town and college community for Red Wolves. There are Red Wolves everywhere. Pictures on buildings, everybody wears Red Wolf t-shirts. Um, it is just an amazing, um, amazing campus. And they give each of the freshmen a book called The Secret Lives of Red Wolves because they take Red Wolf conservation very um, seriously. And we're actually going to be teaching a class uh, next week for their biology students, which should be a lot of fun. But the original is on loan right now to the Bradbury Art Museum. And this is the uh, chancellor of uh, the university with Dale and they're and both doing their- You can see us doing the red wolf howl. Yes. Symbol. And speaking of- Howling. Um, this is actually the most photographed place on campus at um, Arkansas State. And the chancellor's wife wanted to make a statement about red wolves. And so she commissioned and actually paid for this sculpture. Um, you can see us there on one side. And then there's Chris Lasher, who was instrumental in a lot of this. He came over for the unveiling and the lovely Regina. Uh, who drove down, I think the day after the floods. I think your shoes are still wet. In and Jeff Hankins, <clears throat> who is our um, contact at the university. But just another example of how art is being used by the campus to bring awareness to Red Wolves. Now, let's talk about how art can be used uh, to help educate and enlighten. <clears throat> this was a uh, an art show put on. Uh, up in Asheville, just north of us, uh, sponsored by the Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, and it was exhibited at the Butner Gallery and it included a number of different art forms and all of the money or a portion of the money, I should say, uh, for the sale of the artwork uh, went towards uh, Red, Red Wolf Conservation. conservation. Mm -hmm. And included in that show were paintings, sculpture, uh, photographs, jewelry, even stained glass. So it was a very successful um, exhibit. And to, this is one of the paintings that was sold. Uh, this was by Jenny Buckner who owned the gallery. And you can just look at that painting mm. and feel the emotion um, of the red wolf and, and it makes an emotion in us as we look at How it. How can you not fall in love? And then photography is an art form. Uh, this is a, a photograph, one of our favorites that Rebecca Boys uh, did at the Wolf Conservation Center up in New York. They have a casting and we were up there for an unveiling and she shared with us some of her red wolf puppy pictures. And again, how can you not fall in love with this? <laughs> and so we asked her if we could um, use her photograph with credit, of course, and we had note cards made out of it. So if you get oh, a cool. thank you from us, uh, you're hopefully going to learn a little bit about the uh, American Red Wolf. Um, and for those of you that don't have access to photographs, um, one of the things that we found is there are a number of uh, websites, Flickr, um, Upspl Upsplash, mm -hmm. uh, Pixabay, that offer free photos that you can download and use for social media posts or have note cards made out of them. So just because you don't have the photograph, um, don't let that stop you from using uh, photographs online. Absolutely. And you can even contact photographers uh, whose pictures you like and see if they might be willing to share them. And quite often, if you tell them what the cause is, they're more than willing to share their, their photographs with you. And uh, Regina mentioned this film, Red Wolf Resilience. You know, filmmaking is an art form. And Justin and Alex, um, in conjunction with the Endangered Wolf Center and a number of other uh, Red Wolf um, organizations put together this beautiful film. If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. It's free, 15 minutes. Um, it tells the story, but another art form. So if you are a videographer or a filmmaker, you can use those talents to bring awareness to uh, misunderstood animals, especially the American red wolf. 
And the written word, um, one of my favorite things, this is an article that we wrote for <coughs> Sculpture Review, which is the magazine that the National Sculpture Society puts out. And the title of our article was Art, a Champion for Endangered Wildlife. And you can see Dale's Hellbender sculpture um, sort of hidden there and the Red Wolf sculpture and then one of his bat sculptures. So if you wanna read this article, it's on our website, but it talks about using art to bring awareness and inspire uh, conservation. Now, here's another example, <clears throat> jewelry. Uh, these are beaded uh, earrings, uh, very simple, but very, very powerful. So you don't have to create the art, you can wear the art. Right, and I guarantee if you wear wolf earrings, somebody's gonna say, what do you have on your ears? Or if you wear a wolf t-shirt, like we have our endangered wolf here, here. shirts on. We got um, our colors. You get to tell the story of the animal you have on your t-shirt, so. Well, it opens up a dialogue and you can help um, put the word out. Another form of art that a lot of us don't think about is music. Um, this was a, a concert that was organized by uh, Christopher Lyle. And Christopher is a young man that we've met through Defenders of Wildlife. And he learned about red wolves in college and has become an, a huge advocate. And in his hometown of Waynesville, he put together this concert, got lots of local community members to sing and play the piano and play the flute. And in uh, 2019, they had the concert in their church. They passed the hat after the concert and raised over $6,000 for Red Wolf Conservation. Um, just, and the whole community was behind it. And now they all know what Red Wolves are. Um, and Christopher also um, organized the art exhibit we were talking about earlier. So here's an example of a, of a guy who has done a lot and isn't producing the art, is just organizing it. And back to the Girl Scouts. Um, mm. This is a picture that one of the Girl Scouts drew after she visited um, us uh, and saw the Red Wolf sculpture. And I, this is such a great, a great example of you can make a difference when you don't even know it. I mean, when Annie um, drew this picture and then shared it with us, she she's, not, she's not a professional artist. She's not a professional artist, but she probably never envisioned that it would be mm. on a webinar that people from all over the country would be looking at and being inspired by her drawings. So thank you, Annie. Thank you, Annie. It's just another example of how we can each make a difference, no matter what, what we do. And I would be remiss mm. if I didn't mention dance. Um, we were introduced to... Uh, the Red Wolf Puppy Dance when we were at Reflection Riding in Chattanooga, having the uh, casting installed. And Tish, who is their animal um, head animal curator, uh, taught us the Red Wolf Puppy Dance because they were hoping to have puppies. Mm -hmm. And here we are at the Western North Carolina Nature Center where one of Dale's castings was installed. And um, I apologize for the, the laugh track on it. I couldn't figure out how to get that off, but. Let's watch Dale do the and puppy the dance. And the bad performance. A new pair here, a male and a female, and they are hoping that they will breed. And it's coming up on the breeding season. So in order to encourage this, everyone's going to have to figure out their own little pattern, but we've got to start doing the red wolf dance to get those puppies going. So in the privacy of your own home, work on it, work on it, and in the spring, we might have a whole bunch wow. more red wolves and the pack will be expanded. So one of the fun things too is that um, we had people doing the puppy dance as they visited <laughs> red wolf facilities and sending us the videos so if you can get your friends to do the puppy dance, you can post it on social media, be the hit of the party Absolutely. and bring more awareness to red wolves. Um, and the way that we mm -hmm. are trying to spread the word is through our website, uh, your field guide to misunderstood wildlife. And this is the way for us to reach out and use art in all kinds of form, my sculpture, paintings, photographs, 
drawings, drawings, and the Lodi's, Lodi's uh, uh, writings that she has uh, put on the website, using all kinds of art forms to spread the word. And one of them is our blog on our growing wolf pack. So if you have an interest in how the castings were actually made or where else they have ended up, we've got some pictures of the installations and tell the story. Um, and you can check us out. That's at right. Woods for if wildlife. you're wondering what mischief we are getting into, do check us out on our website. And we're also on Instagram and Facebook. So we wanted to leave you with a quote from one of my heroes, Jane Goodall. She's one of the most amazing wildlife conservationists ever lived, I think. And what Jane says is you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. And what you do makes a difference. And only you can decide what kind of difference you wanna make. And remember a small effort in your mind can be a huge effort and make a big difference. Lodi and I could never realize how much impact we've been able to make with just the two of us. And you don't have to be an artist in order to spread the word. You can plan and organize an art show or a concert or work with wonderful organizations like <clears throat> The, the, endangered. the endangered wolf center and collectively working together we really can spread the word and educate the public and get people to fall in love with the underdogs just like Lodi and myself and each one of you tonight is making a difference just by watching this webinar because you have the ability now to go out and spread the word do social media posts but you've taken the time tonight to learn something we so hope. Thank you. And we appreciate that. But every one of you has made a difference just by watching this. And Regina, uh, we're gonna pass it back to you because I think you're going to share another art form. I am. I, I can't say enough how amazing what you two do is. Um, and I, I, I have to say from a personal perspective, seeing that sculpture the first time as a scientist, you know, we talk often about animal behavior and all that stuff, but it just doesn't connect the way that art does. And one of my favorite, um, the emotions that I get from looking at that sculpture is it shows the bond that a mother wolf has with their baby in a way that no words <laughs> that I could ever give um, would ever do. And I've been lucky enough to see that bond and how you did it, how you captured it in that sculpture is it's literally magical. Um, and it's important. I mean, that's a great example of that shows people a side of wolves that they would never be able to see otherwise. And it connects them to them in a way that is, is very powerful. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. So I just want to say thank you again for that beautiful piece and all the pieces that you do. Um, so um, really quick, I have um, somebody that I wanna introduce, my amazing husband. Um, Travis Wasati is a award-winning poet um, and my favorite poet, I'm not biased at all, um, but you can find his books on Amazon. Um, but one of my favorite books that he's done is Field Study. And as Dale and Lodi mentioned, <laughs> as Dale and Lodi mentioned, um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's so many different ways that you can impact conservation. And when I give talks to students at universities, they always ask me, you know, what degree do I need to get in biology? Well, biology or something similar is one field, but communications, education, arts. I mean, there's so many different, um, go into law, you can go into filmmaking. There's just so many different ways um, that you can help with conservation. Um, and even like, you know, they said in, in your own backyard, planting native gardens. I mean, you can make impacts in all sorts of, of different ways. But Travis um, is a poet, obviously, and that's his way of connecting. And um, again, one of my favorite books that he's written, I'm not biased at all, um, is called Field Study. And it's about um, his time uh, with me doing some of the crazy work that I've gotten to do in my life and that we've been able to do together. And so I'm going to turn it over to Travis. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it always seems fitting to uh, end things on a uh, poem or some soft, you know, 
kind of note of reverence. Uh, this book came out in 2014, and it, it really did show the power of um, how art can open up discussions and create interdisciplinary opportunities. I did a 10 state, 16 city book tour that took me through uh, Arizona, Oregon, Idaho, a lot of places where wolves uh, exist in the wild. And um, I got to read these poems to people along the way and start a lot of conversations. Um, this poem in particular that I was uh, going to share with everybody tonight is a poem that I often read. It's about the Endangered Wolf Center, which is here in St. Louis and often has uh, fairly cold winters, at least historically. Um, and uh, this one winter in particular, um, there was a power outage. Now, uh, for the Endangered Wolf Center, they house uh, some species like the African painted dog who are not used to Missouri winters um, and are not really equipped to handle the cold temperatures. So they have den boxes which are heated and generators when the power goes out that need to be filled with gasoline. And so the night of this poem is a night where we went out, Regina and myself, to go uh, refill the generators. It's called Midnight After the Snowstorm. 10 degrees below zero and the moon ate everything white, made the heave and suck of each step glow, while the generators hummed along as casually as a gang of dock workers with crisp bills between their fingers. A Mexican wolf paced us down the fenced corridor, never saw, only felt him and the others in the pack, their eyes. After refueling the generators until they brimmed, with enough fuel to keep the den boxes heated until dawn, we began the slow walk back to the truck, listened to night break down into a fit of howls of longing, lonely. And now, whenever I hold the sound of those animals, it opens like a dogwood blossom. But then I squeeze too hard and it dies. I squeeze until those fences, which shimmered brilliant as jewels inside night's fists, turn to ash, turn and fall like snowflakes bristling through fir and pine. And I am empty again, my hands out, offering this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we do poetry snaps? Yes, yes, you have to do poetry now. Yeah. It's required. <clears throat> we know you're all doing them too. Okay, thank you so much, <laughs> Travis. Um, let's go ahead and I'm going to share my screen. I want to show you um, something that we've been working on recently that ties in really nicely here. Um, so I'm going to, um, hopefully you can see that here. Um, we recently did a little t-shirt contest um, here at the Endangered Wolf Center. So if you follow us on any of our social media, you probably saw that we were sharing this and encouraging artists to get involved. And this is just another example of a really easy, fun way to get involved with conservation. And we were so glad to see all the fun designs that came in. And you can see here all different styles, all different age ranges that were getting involved. Um, one of my favorites here, we can uh, see that there's a a mom wolf that looks like howling on the top of this cave and then there's some puppies in the cave. I absolutely loved to see these submissions coming in. It was really amazing. And then we narrowed it down. We did a voting round and you all got to vote for your favorite. And now that shirt is being sold in our t-shirt store. And I'll put a link to that in the chat. But you can see what the finished design looks like there. And people can now wear it and be able to have that little conversation starter about uh, why they love wolves and why they want to protect the heart of the wild. So that's available now, um, but that was a really fun way. And I wanted to put a little bit of bullet points here to share with you some other ways that you can get involved um, in saving the American red wolf and in conservation of other animals. One way is to use your talents to create a fundraiser. So there's actually the shirt company that we work with, it's called Bonfire and I'll share in the chat, but they have a, a new feature where you can actually create your own art and run your own fundraiser 
for a nonprofit of your choice. So it doesn't have to be us. We would like it if it was us, <laughs> but you can do that. And that's a really fun way to get involved. Um, you can also volunteer with a local wildlife center. You can adopt um, our pack of American red wolves. I think I saw in the comments somebody that um, adopts our Mexican wolf pack. So we love to see that. And that's a really great way to get involved and to have a really special relationship with a pack of wolves is to make an adoption, which is a symbolic adoption. Um, you can also educate others. Dale and Lodi mentioned that, um, you know, just even a social media post can make a world of difference because a lot of these animals, these underdogs, like they mentioned, uh, people just don't know that they exist. They don't know why they should save them. So um, using your tools like social media and any outlet you have is a great way. And you can also, if you're local to St. Louis, you can visit us to learn more. We do have private tours available and um, those are small groups and uh, out in nature. So that's a great activity even in winter to get involved in. Um, I put along here the bottom, we are on all of these social media platforms. So if you wanna type in Endangered Wolf Center and follow us there, um, that's another way to stay involved. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. <clears throat> and I wanted to read off some of the questions and see if we can get some answers. Um, hey, Victoria, can I just add one thing to another way to help? Absolutely. And, and you, I think you might've mentioned this um, briefly, but I just, I wanna say how, how much it makes an impact. I've gotten to see it firsthand, but um, you know, the Endangered Species Act and different endangered species that are out there definitely need a voice. And um, you guys can all be that voice. And um, those who need to hear that are our representatives, both federal and state. And I used to be cynical and think that nobody ever heard me, <laughs> but I was lucky enough to go to, ACE, um, to the Capitol in DC and talk to some of our senators and congressmen with, um, about Red Wolves with uh, some of our friends from A State. And it was amazing. They heard um, folks from A State that were writing them about Red Wolf conservations. We got there and they're like, oh yeah, we've, we've heard about Red Wolf some, some of our constituents. So that was incredible and so inspirational to me. So write your representatives, tell them that you want them to help save endangered species like the American Red Wolf and they listen. Um, so just another way that you can get involved as well. Thanks, Regina. So I wanted to ask a couple of these questions that came through. Some of them we were able to answer um, in that Q&A feature. So hopefully if you ask the question, um, you're seeing your answer there. Um, there's one question um, that I think is really an interesting one. Do you think that we will see red wolves make a comeback in the wild in the next 50 years. Regina, what do you think about that one? Absolutely. Um, it, if nothing else, the amount of um, voices rallying behind the Red Wolf since they hit their issues a few years ago has been incredible. You know, from organizations like uh, the Species Survival Plan, the different captive programs that are um, uh, captive facilities that, that manage the breeding part of things, um, and the education and research side of things, and Smithsonian and C2S2. And I mean, there's so many different organizations out there. And, and Dale and Lodi mentioned um, several of them that are working on Red Wolf conservation and not just working on it, but they're working together um, and really coming up again with creative ways to look at what's worked in the past, um, what hasn't worked in the past, and to make a solid plan for moving forward in the future. Um, and as I mentioned, Fish and Wild Services is, is helping too. I mean, they're putting money um, towards Red Wolf enclosures. They are doing research right now and trying to figure out um, the next steps forward, especially on reintroduction efforts. Um, they just reintroduced um, uh, some Red Wolves uh, this past winter um, in an effort to try and help with the North Carolina population. So I do have a lot of hope, um, but it's going to take all of us working together. It's going to take incredible people like Dale and Lodi um, coming up with ways to, to touch the hearts of the American public. Um, so I have a lot of hope, um, especially with all of you guys joining us today. So Dale and Lodi, your thoughts? Oh, mute. Take your mute off. There, I think we are. 
Um, we agree with you 100%. Um, and one of the things that I failed to mention earlier is we are going to be doing the last um, round of castings of Dale Sculpture. And so if you know of any organization or any SSP facility that hasn't gotten one that could benefit from it to use it for bringing awareness, you know, please let us know in the next couple of weeks because we are going to do the final run by the end of the week. But we agree, Regina, there are so many people just, I mean, there've been all these people tonight that will help make a difference. No, no, it's, uh, we, uh, we are so excited about getting involved and uh, we get so much more in return than what we give. We, we feel embarrassed that it's so one-sided that we get so much. Thank you. Okay, let's go to another question. This one I think is uh, directed towards Dale and Lodi. Um, this one is, how effective is each form of art in raising awareness to endangered species in the wild? From your experience, what would you say? Wow, that's quite, quite a question. Um, I think all forms of art mm -hmm. are effective. Um, you know, it, it's, and it's not just doing the art, but then sharing the art, you know, share it on social media, just like the Girl Scout did. She shared her drawing with us. You know, that was, um, she put herself out there by sharing it with us. Um, so you, you have to share it, but I think every form of art can draw people in, um, poetry, the written word. Dance. Dance. Absolutely. I mean, let's all do the puppy <laughs> dance. No, so, it, there it, you go. No, <laughs> it, 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 it really is amazing to see how art will impact people in different ways. And there are some art forms that, you know, we hadn't thought of uh, to see the impact that they will have, like Annie's little drawing of a red wolf, uh, to have someone so young uh, with so little experience to create something that can move people in amazing ways. So every art form is a great way. Just share yeah. it. And just to add to that, I mean, just from my kids' perspective, you know, different people learn in different ways and, and, and view the world in different ways. You know, my daughter is very auditory. So the written word, reading books, I mean, she just, she's voracious at that. And my son is, is visual. He loves art, like looking at it and touching it and feeling it. So, you know, just from that perspective, um, it depends on who you're talking to, I bet. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think one thing that we've noticed tonight is I loved seeing some of that behind the scenes uh, work of how Dale was actually creating that sculpture. That was amazing. And <laughs> I think I need to go out and get myself a, a rock pile. <laughs> I've got some if you want it. <laughs> Dale, didn't you tell me when we were when we were first discussing this webinar that you had to be uh, silly to do stone sculpting. <laughs> yes, there are not too many of us around. Uh, the more intelligent artists stayed away from stone. Uh, it truly is a labor of love, but it's what I was placed on this earth to do. So I'm making the best of it. I love it. And I think that that really speaks to the passion behind it that, um, you know, no matter what art form you're pursuing and that you're you're working towards to help impact conservation. If that passion is there, you can do incredible things. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something, Lodi? No, I was just going to say, and he is my favorite wildlife sculptor. <laughs> Not by You're biased too, by. Lodi. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I saw another question for Dale and Lodi here that was, where can they get those earrings? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, you know, I. The, the, Look on the internet, that's, that's, where, that's where we found them. But you know, think about how simple those were, beaded earrings. I mean, you know, people do silver earrings and, you know, bracelets and pendants, but, um, you know, I never would have thought of beading earrings. Um, so how cool, but they're on the internet. <clears throat> yeah, that's amazing. Um, I, I noticed one other question uh, was somebody asking about, um, they, it looks like they already adopt a Mexican wolf pack at our center and they asked, is there any other ways to help them? So I, I've been putting in the chat, hopefully everybody's been finding 
all of the different ways that you can get involved and keep learning and keep educating yourself and others. I've been putting a lot of links. I will be sharing those when I send a little recap email with this recorded uh, version and a link to that recording. But if you're in here now and can click on any of those links, I'm also going to put a little um, donation link if you want to make a donation to help support Red Bull. Um, I'm putting that in the chat right now. Um, there it is. And I just want to say thank you to that member. I mean, that's incredible that they adopted Mac. Um, Mac and Vera are very special wolves and their support literally helps us do the work that we do. Um, you know, from puppy fostering and, and getting Mac's puppies out into the wild. And um, so we just want to say thank you. That, that makes a big difference. And I just saw another question come in that is about um, reintroduction of red wolves. It says, are there any areas other than Alligator River where captive born wolves could potentially be reintroduced? Regina, you wanna take that one? Yeah, absolutely. There are what are called habitat suitability assessments that scientists have done over the last several years that have looked at the entire historic range of the red wolf in the Southeastern United States. and that's. Their historic range is from Missouri over to the East Coast, down to Florida and over to Texas. Um, and there's definitely spots left. Um, you know, if, if uh, I mean, if you've been to Southern Missouri or Northern Arkansas, I mean, it's, the Ozarks are gorgeous. Um, Tennessee area is beautiful. Um, same with Florida, there's definitely a lot of green spaces left, but it takes us getting the word out um, and, and like I said, going from wolves being a, you know, either a, a things that people think about what they see on TV, um, which is completely inaccurate, um, to being a source of pride, you know, and every single person that's here today could make a big difference. You never know who you're talking to that could live in a potential future recovery area for these things and could make a difference. Um, so you're all ambassadors now. <laughs> I hope we'll be ready for that to step up and do it. Um, but yeah, there's definitely spaces left. Again, that's why I have so much hope for this species. We just, we got to get the ball rolling. We've got to get those reintroductions started as soon as we can. That's great. And it's so exciting that we're going to be able to house more red wolves um, soon at the Endangered Wolf Center. We're very excited about that. And um, if anyone is local, um, we hope that you'll be able to come out and see us um, soon. Even with COVID, we had to shut down briefly, but we've reopened and are offering those private tours um, and some, some photography tours. So if you're a photographer in the area, we would love to see you. Um, that's actually how I got started um, working with wolves at the Endangered Wolf Center was I do video production. So I came out and I wanted to film the animals and try to raise awareness about them. So um, yeah, it can really lead to um, a lot of awareness, um, especially because you know we think about even like we mentioned social media, when we're sharing these things, we all have different people that we know in our network and, and all of you now can be those uh, ambassadors for our wolves. Um, we saw even our, oh, sorry, Victoria, I was gonna say, even our animals are, are artists. Um, you know, we, some of our animals do paintings. You know, some of the guys who, uh, like our African painted dogs who we do training programs with, who don't have a release program or a recovery program, do paintings. So even they get in on the action of, of doing art for conservation. Everybody's doing it. <laughs> Yeah, we're hoping to get some of those available for your holiday shopping. So holiday shopping comes around, keep the wolves in mind that you can still make a difference even when you're doing that type of uh, shopping and, uh, and that can still be educating your family members. <laughs> get everybody to love wolves as much as you do. <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't see any other questions. I saw a ton of great uh, response to the chat. We appreciate all of your kind words. A lot of people were saying that this has been very inspirational, that they love the art and poetry and the passion behind it. So we're really grateful for everybody that tuned in and stayed tuned uh, for our, our Q&A section. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and close out now. And uh, thank you so much to Dale and Lodi of Weiler Woods for Wildlife. And to do this. Go Red Wolves. Wolves up. Wolves up. Wolves up. Go Red Wolves. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Closing out, everybody. Good night. Good Thank night. You all. Thanks, Alex. Bye.